So happy to have each of you here with us today. I'm, I'm certainly privileged to be here and to, to be the first speaker today on this lectureship program. I spoke to somebody and they said it can only go up from here as far as the speakers are concerned. And uh, we certainly are just so appreciative that uh, you made the trip to be here. Some came from a great distance and so many preachers in our assembly today. And we appreciate your good work so very much. Appreciate that good song that Brother Charles led for us this morning. What a way to start out our Monday morning in praising our God and singing together, praying together, now opening up the Holy Scriptures and studying the Word together. Jesus gave a three-point outline of the Old Testament in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44 when he referenced the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he talked about those three sections of the Old Testament and all of those um, having things certainly that um, were in reference to him. He would fulfill all things that were written in those sections. The Psalms, uh, we think about uh, the poetry section of the Old Testament. They could be broken down like this. The book of Job, suffering. The book of Ecclesiastes, the real meaning of life. The uh, book of Song of Solomon, married love. Proverbs, general morality and decision making. And Psalms, Praise to God. That's what we're doing here today. This is a lecture ship, but we're praising God. We're praising God. Every time the Holy Scriptures are read, as we are reading them today and studying them today, we are praising our God. We're going to be looking at Psalm 3 this morning, if you'd like to be finding that in your Bibles. And in this psalm, we're going to emphasize the thought that God gives me help. God it is that gives me help. Help And certainly to, to receive help from our study today, when you look at a Bible passage, when you look at a passage such as Psalm 3, we need to see personal application in it. We need to see ourselves in it as we're studying it. And if we refuse to make application of uh, a psalm or of another chapter of the Bible, it just becomes in some way ancient history, unrelated history in some ways if we don't make application. One man has said this, he said, to me it seems that the Psalms are to him who sings them as a mirror, wherein he may see himself and the motions of his soul, and with like feelings utter them. So also one who hears the psalm read takes it as if it were spoken concerning himself, and either convicted by his own conscience will be pricked at the heart and repent, or else hearing of that hope which is to Godward's and the sucker which is vouchsafed to them that believe leaps for joy as though such grace were specially made over him and begins to utter his thanksgiving to God. And so as we read this psalm, as we study it, we're going to look at the perspective certainly from David. We're going to recognize the best way that we can with the information that we have, what David may have been going through as he penned this psalm, but we need not forget that we need to find application for ourselves. Though none of us have been rejected, I'm certain, the way David was rejected. None of us went through what he went through as his son Absalom rebelled against him and the very things that he suffered, but you have suffered. You know people that have suffered, and if you haven't yet, you will at some point in your life suffer a tragedy, an illness, something that you may certainly be brought to your knees, as David could very well have been here on this occasion, and we need to recognize that God is indeed our help. Let's go ahead and read the psalm together, these eight verses. Psalm 3, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept, I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. The points we're going to look at are just very simple, right, right, really right from the text. We're going to divide it into four simple sections. We're going to start with the conspiracy and we see a lot about that in, in the uninspired heading. We're going to talk about that in a moment. The confidence.
confidence that David had, his courage in spite of what he was going through, and then ultimately the conquest that, that he, he would enjoy because of God and because of God's work. In the first place, the conspiracy. The uninspired heading, I didn't read it, but I will now. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. When we study this psalm, we have to keep in mind the background, at least that, that uninspired background that's given. And that background is very old, and it's, it's been accepted uh, by many, this tradition that David would have penned this, uh, either while he, while he was fleeing from Absalom, his son, or, or perhaps um, thinking about that very occasion. And you can read about it, and, and we certainly can't do that today. 2 Samuel chapters 15 through 18. It would have been good perhaps uh, for, for you to read about that before you even came here today. You're going to hear about Absalom so many times this week. You're going to hear about King Saul, and you're going to hear about Bathsheba, and you're going to hear about Uriah, and you're going to hear about Nathan. You're going to hear about the various things in David's life over and over and over when you're indeed studying Psalms that David wrote. And we're not going to be able to take a lot of time, but you know the account very well, I'm sure. Uh, David had reigned for 40 years, um, and Absalom, his son, wanted to take over the kingdom. And Absalom worked it out. In fact, the Bible uses the word conspiracy. In, um, over in 2 Samuel chapter 15, uh, verse 6 says, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. In verse 12 of 2 Samuel 15, it says, The conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. Absalom would uh, be there in some strategic place where he could head off those people that were coming to Jerusalem that may have had some type of a complaint. Something was going on with them, and he would, he would intersect them, if you will. And he would, tell, me, tell me what's going on with you. Tell me what your problem is, friend. Come over here. I, I'm here. I'm all ears. And they would tell him the problem, oh, if I were in charge, this is what I would do. Or there ought to be somebody who, who would take care of this because you are just and you are right in this. And because of this, these lies telling people what they wanted to hear, uh, Absalom became very popular, a very, a very good-looking, um, kingly-looking man, I'm sure. And he told everybody what they wanted to hear. And so the Bible says that he stole the hearts of, of, of the people. And so Absalom um, concocted this plan and this conspiracy with Ahithophel, David's counselor, ultimately went to Hebron and made the announcement that he was now reigning as king and many others, many of Israel followed and it came to David's ears and David said, we need to flee Jerusalem. And so they fled Jerusalem very quickly, although David left behind, I believe it was 10 of his concubines uh, there to keep the house or, or some things there in Jerusalem. And David left and he crossed the brook Kidron on the eastern side of Jerusalem, ascended the Mount of Olives, barefooted, weeping as, as he perhaps looks back upon the city. And then David flees to the wilderness as Absalom, his son, is endeavoring even to take his life, not just his kingdom. Although we don't have a lot of time to deal with this, there is a great parallel with Jesus Christ and his rejection of the people of Israel. Jesus certainly was rejected by, by his own. Jesus, not necessarily having to flee Jerusalem because they were trying to take him at this point, but Jesus left Jerusalem, also crossed the brook Kidron, also ascended the Mount of Olives, also wept as he looked upon the city of Jerusalem. Also, one of Jesus' twelve, one of his apostles betrayed him, sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Ahithophel uh, did that to David. Ahithophel uh, took um, sides with, with Absalom. And you can see, ultimately, Ahithophel uh, hanged himself. Hanged himself when his counsel was defeated by the wisdom and providence of God. He went and hanged himself exactly as Judas would do. Uh, you can go further with this. It's just an amazing parallel. Uh, I think you can go further and recognize that David was willing to die for his enemy. He was willing to die for Absalom. When he found out that Joab had killed Absalom, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, would to God that I had died for thee. And so he was willing to die for even his enemy, as Jesus not only was willing to die for his enemies, but he did indeed die for his enemies. 
On the way up the Mount of Olives, uh, David even made reference to the fact, and you can read it in 2 Samuel 15, that whatever, it, whatever God's will is regarding him, he'll accept that. Uh, perfect parallel. Jesus, not far from that very spot, prayed, not my will be done, but, but your will be done. And so there was this great conspiracy. Uh, those in this psalm, at least, we find out were taunting him. They were taunting David, and they were saying to David, or of David, there is no help for him in God. And again, there's a parallel, is there not? As he was hanging upon the cross, our Lord, uh, those who went by, he trusted in the Lord, let him save him if he will have him. And they taunted our Lord there. There is no help for him in God. Perhaps David allowed this to infiltrate his heart somewhat. Why would David ever think that God would not be there, would not be available to him to help him? Well, in Psalm 51, after David sinned with Bathsheba, after he had been complacent um, in, in some of the things that he, he, he um, his service to God and complicit in the death of Uriah as he had him murdered, this is what he wrote. He wrote in Psalm 51, 11, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Psalm 51, 11. He went on to petition the next verse, Psalm 51, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And then verse 3 of that same chapter, David talked about the guilt that he, he carried with him daily when he said, My sin is ever before me. With that backdrop in mind, David had sinned with Bathsheba, had murdered Uriah, the Hittite, and now his son Absalom took the kingdom in essence from him and David is fleeing Jerusalem and David's enemies are saying to him, there is no help for him in God. And he could very easily allow that, that thought to enter his mind and think, well, maybe God won't help me. Maybe because of my sin, God will not be there and will not help me. Now that's not indeed the way David responded as, as we're going to see as we keep reading this, this text. The word selah is used here, and I'm the first speaker today, so I'm going to talk about this just for a moment, although some may spend much more time with it than I'm going to. It's the first occurrence of the word in the Psalms, and it's found 71 times. Its meaning is somewhat amb ambiguous. Um, when you read, when you read a, a definition of this word, sometimes you, you'll read uh, varying things. Now, perhaps it was a moment, a pause in the lyrics uh, during a time that perhaps instruments could continue to play as they used those often in the Old Testament as they, as they would sing these, these psalms, these songs. And it gave, it gave the worshipers the opportunity to pause and to think about what was just said or what they had just sung together while those instruments. And so a moment of reflection, a moment to pause it's, it's wonderful, the wonderful speakers that we have, and, and so many, I'm sure, here are able to do this well, are able to use an effective pause when they preach. That is actually, actually pause and stop, say something meaningful, and then pause and let people ponder that for a moment. I don't have that ability. I just don't, I don't even take a breath most of the time when I preach. That's why my sermons are limited about 30, 35 minutes, because I'll pass out if, if I keep going. And it just amazes me. The, the men that can speak and say something meaningful and just pause. Well, that's, what, that's what's being done here. We sing these two verses, if we were singing this, this psalm, sing these two verses and then pause for that moment to reflect. What would we think about? Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. And then pause. And then consider... What is going through David's mind? What must David be thinking? How will David respond? What will he do? What would I do? What would I do if my world had been turned upside down and I lost much in my life and there were many antagonists who were saying, God will not help him. What would I do in response to that? Well, we don't have to guess about David. Verses 3 and 4, we can see David's confidence. But thou, O Lord... Notice how there's a contrasting conjunction there, contrasting what those antagonists, those enemies of his said. God is, isn't going to help him. There's no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. 
I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. David's confidence was not shaken. Though his enemies were, were many, he said, though ten thousands, uh, he says, and we read there a moment ago in this text, w- would surround him. His confidence wasn't shaken. Uh, he, he, he knows that it is God who, who, is, who is these at least four things. And again, if you read the Psalms, you're going to see this over and over and over. Uh, some of the very words that he's using here, he, he says four things. God is a shield for me. He is my glory. He is the lifter up of mine head. And ultimately, he is the one who answers my prayers. Uh, I, I called unto him, and he heard me. Let's think about that first one, a shield. Thou art a shield. Now, when David fought Goliath, and that's when we're, I know we're introduced to him somewhat earlier, and we, we know some things about him perhaps earlier than that, but when David went out to fight Goliath very early on in his career as a warrior, although he had already killed a lion and he killed a bear, uh, when he went out to fight Goliath, he, he carried no shield with him. Of course, he carried no sword. He carried no spear uh, with him. He carried no bow with him. He had a staff, and he had a sling, and he had the five smooth stones. Now, when he went out to fight this, this man that was nearly ten feet tall, this, this giant, as he went out to fight him, Goliath came out carrying uh, a sword and a spear and a shield. And when David uh, approached him, and of course, the Bible says that Goliath disdained him, looked down upon um, this man, this young man David as he came out to fight Goliath and it somewhat offended Goliath that the the Israelites would send out this as their champion to to fight him and uh, this is what David said to Goliath, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. You know, David didn't change that attitude much. Even here in this psalm, when he's, when he's talking about what God is able to do in verse 7, Arise, O Lord, save me. He recognizes that all God has to do is act, and it is a foregone conclusion that God can, that he has the ability, that he will act on David's behalf, that he will intervene, and he will take care of this issue. Uh, Dave, that's a consistency with David throughout his life. And he says, You are a shield. And so as he walked out there to fight Goliath, uh, he recognized God as his shield. The battle is the Lord's. He gave him the credit, gave him the glory for the things that, that he had done. Barnes said about a shield, he said that the shield was a well-known part of ancient armor. And according to ancient modes of warfare, when swords and spears and arrows, time of David, uh, were used, they were usually made of, of a tough and thick hides fastened to a rim, and so attached to the left arm so that they could be readily thrown before the body when attacked, or so that as they were usually held, the vital parts of the body would be protected. And so he's saying that that God is my protector. God is my shield. He's the one that is protecting me. And he often talked about that in reference to other uh, other servants of God, that, that God is a shield. His son Solomon would, would later write in Proverbs 30 in verse 5, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. And of course, I know in in our minds as Bible students, automatically we can't help but think about what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians when he talked about the Christian armor in chapter 5, 14 through 16, when he said, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And so the, the, God is our shield. And there we talk about that shield of faith. David secondly recognized the Lord as his glory. There can be no doubt that all glory and honor belongs unto God no matter what we may accomplish in our life. The lifter up of mine head. Isn't that a beautiful expression? If you've suffered, you've bowed your head in some way. If you've suffered, and, and no doubt many, many in our assembly today have suffered, perhaps the loss of a loved one, uh, perhaps with a terrible illness in your life. You may, you may understand the figure very well where David would later write, I bow down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother, 
Psalm 35 and verse 14. Our Lord, when he was on the cross, the Bible says that uh, he said, It is finished, bowed his head, and gave up the ghost, John 19 and verse, verse 30. But David said, He's the lifter up of mine head. And so in, in his plight, in what was going on in his life with this rebellion of Absalom, and I know I'm talking about as if that is the definite 100% background of this psalm. That's all the background that we have to go on. And so I'm using that and rolling with that here this morning. But as he fled Absalom, as he's suffering greatly, he would have reason to bow his head in despair. But he says, you are the lifter up of mine head. God is the one that can lift up our heads when we suffer as well. And then he says there in the fourth verse that God's the one who hears my prayers and answers my prayers. Uh, he heard me. God heard me. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Did not the Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 say, say the same thing to us and for us today? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James would say, James uh, chapter 5 and verse 16. And of course Peter uh, would say that the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous his ears are open unto their prayers. In Jerusalem, yes. In the temple, yes. Crossing the brook Kidron, barefooted, weeping, fleeing your home, yes. In the wilderness, yes. No matter where uh, one may be, God hears our prayers. And God answers those prayers. And his eyes are over the righteous, the one who's living that righteous life and, and serving God. Let's notice in the next place the great courage that David possessed. I don't suppose anyone would doubt the courage of David, the courage of a, of a young man who would go out and stand before uh, Goliath as he did. No one would doubt David's courage. And he said in this text, I laid me down and slept. I awake for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Insomnia is something that some people suffer with, and I, I'm not indicating that insomnia is a lack of faith. Uh, I, I'm not doing that, but, but one, one study suggested that anxiety and depression are two of the most common causes of, of chronic insomnia. And, and again, I'm not suggesting that someone who, who has issue with anxiety or has depression has a lack of faith in God, so, so please, please let me put that disclaimer out here because because we know certainly that there are many um, chemical imbalances and things that go on uh, in, in the human body and the human brain that, that, that really bring about some of these things. But, but I only want to mention this. Very often when we're anxious over things, when we're worrisome over things, we'll lose sleep. We won't have the ability to, to lay down and sleep. Very often when we're depressed, it's very difficult to find any sleep. You may sleep maybe a little bit or a few hours and then wake up and whatever that, that care is that, that we're thinking about, it's right there. And it's, it's preventing us from sleeping as, as we could otherwise sleep. Well, David says here, in the midst of everything he's going to, I laid me down and slept. David was able, able to sleep. He was able to, to lay down and he was able to sleep because he said, the Lord sustained me. In, in chapter 4, of course, Psalm 4 and verse 8, David wrote that one as well. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. And so David, in spite of everything that he was going through, was able to lay down and get some sleep. He was able to have that much confidence and that much trust in God. Charles Spurgeon said that a good conscience can sleep in the mouth of a cannon. I just love that quote. A good conscience can sleep in the mouth of a cannon. And David had that type of conscience apparently. Though David at times was certainly guilty over his sin, he was able to have so much trust in God that he could sleep. The Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 12, I just love that text where Peter is there. James had already been executed. Peter will be executed apparently the next day. And Peter sleeping so soundly that an angel had to poke him in the side to wake him up. Would you be sleeping that soundly if you were being executed tomorrow? Peter was sleeping so soundly the angel poked him in the side to get him up. Jesus says he's on this tiny fishing vessel 
on the Sea of Galilee and as the storm was, was so ferocious and the sea was whipped into such a frenzy that the fishermen felt that they were going to perish, that the boat would, would capsize, that they would perish. I, I've preached that and talked about that for years and I've often talked about the, the professional fisherman as opposed to Jesus being a carpenter. And someone said, well, maybe the fishermen would have known more about it and they would have known that the sea was so, so terrible that that they would have been more alarmed than Jesus because he wouldn't have had the same knowledge. I just can't really buy that. I can't really accept that, that Jesus wouldn't have understood that there was a possibility that a boat could capsize uh, in such a storm. But as these, these men had a lack of faith, Jesus, of course, rebuked their faith. Um, Jesus was asleep, and, and Mark's, Mark mentioned that, that he was in the hinder part of, a ship, of the ship asleep on a pillow. And they come and they, they wake him up. And there, there's certainly, we can see a consistency in these servants of God. Whether it's David who, who's running, in essence, from Absalom. Or whether it's the Apostle Peter who, who believes he's going to be executed. Or our Lord Jesus Christ as he's in this ship that's being tossed to and fro. They were all able to lay down and sleep. They were able to have that much trust in God. And so these great servants of God trusted in the providence of God. They trusted in God's sustaining providence and, and his power. David said in Psalm 37 and verse 25, I once was young, but now I'm old, and I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And of course, Jesus, when he spoke in Matthew chapter 6, told us as his followers not to worry about these, these physical things of life, things that are necessities. Yes, God is going to take care of those things. God feeds the birds. God, God provides, and he'll provide for you, and he'll provide for me. And so we need to be willing to have the, the type of courage that David had. He said in this text, not only did he say, I, I will lay me down and sleep, for the Lord sustained me. There's that providential um, watchfulness and care of God. Uh, he says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Was David using hyperbolic language here? Was he just saying, um, using hyperbole, overstating the case? Well, ten thousands of people be about me, and I'm not going to be afraid. I don't think so. I don't think uh, that was the type of language that David was, was using. Because Ahithophel, when he's giving counsel to Absalom, and Absalom says, what should we do? He says, choose out 12,000 men, pursue David, uh, catch up with him, and crush him. So that's what he said, let's choose 12,000 men, meaning no doubt that there were more than 12,000 to choose from. And so when David says, I'm not going to be afraid if 10,000s of men are surrounding me about, it, it, isn't going to, it isn't going to change my faith, it isn't going to change my trust in, in thee. The Apostle Paul, I love the statement in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, when he says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And then later in that same chapter, he said, Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. Great illustration of this is Elisha the prophet. The Syrian army surrounds Elisha the prophet in the night. And his servant goes out and he sees this army surrounding, uh, surrounding them. And, and you know the account very well, but I, I just love to tell the story. I just love to tell it. And they're, they're surrounded there, and panicking, no doubt, comes to Elisha, and what, what can we do? We're surrounded. Uh, they have us, and I'm putting this in my words. Uh, we, just, we just can't escape from this. And Elisha said, there are more with us than there are with them. And he prayed that his eyes would be opened. And when his eyes were opened, he saw those, those chariots of fire. He saw those horses. He saw them surrounding Elisha around there. I, I like to think about the protective power of God, even the unseen realm, the protective power of God, when we pray that God protects us, when we pray that God watches over us, he has the power to do so. We need to have the faith that he's able to do so. We know that he can. Uh, we know that fundamentally. We know that when we read the scriptures informationally. But do we believe that when, when it is... It is us who, when we are on the run, when we are suffering, when we are in a difficult circumstance. David believed that. David trusted in God so much. Ten thousand, it wouldn't bother, it didn't bother uh, this, this warrior king. 
this warrior king who, who as a young man, of course, we talked about, went out to fight a giant with five smooth stones. It doesn't bother David now. David has trust that God is able to protect him. In the last place, verses 7 and 8, we haven't been pointing out the Selahs through this, but they're, they're here every two verses. Um, we're asked to stop and pause and ponder and think. Verses 7 and 8, Arise, O Lord, and save me. This is the conquest. O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. And again, he ends the psalm with the word, the word Selah. God only needs act. And it's a foregone conclusion in David's mind that, that God can take care of this issue. And he isn't saying that God is idly by, unconcerned about David, that he cares not that David's suffering this way. That's not what he's saying at all. He's not pointing out, well, God, you should have been here in the past. You should have been here. I should never have had to leave Jerusalem in the first place. You should have stopped this immediately. He, he doesn't say that. He's just saying now, arise, O Lord, save me. And he has faith and trust that when God decides to intervene, that it is a foregone conclusion. When he decides to act, uh, he certainly has the power, he certainly has the ability to, to defeat this enemy of David. And David calls upon past deliverances. Notice it's past tense. Arise, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. He knows that God has been there. We need to do that. We need to call upon past deliverances as children of God. When we suffer something today or we have a setback, whatever it may be, we need to, to recognize and remember, God, I know you, you've been there. You've sustained me. You've answered my prayers. You've watched over me. You've cared for me for all of these years. And I have trust that you can do it now. That's what David is doing. And David is saying that, that you've, you've smitten my enemies upon the cheekbone. Barnes said this about, about this very um, vivid language. Um, he says, and I quote, this language seems to be taken from a comparison of his enemies with wild beasts. And the idea is that God had disarmed them as one would a lion or tiger by breaking out his teeth. The cheekbone denotes the bone in which the teeth are placed, and to smite that is to disarm the animal. Uh, he had deprived them of power of doing him wrong. Remember, he already said, you're a shield to me. The shield would protect the vital area of, of the soldier, of the warrior. And he already said, God, I know that you're the one that protects me, but not only protect me in this way being a shield, but disarm them. Take, smite them, and, and you have done that. Uh, you've knocked out their teeth. Uh, you, you've smitten them upon, upon the cheekbones. And then David says um, here in this text, the, the last verse, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. It's very difficult for some people in their own pride to admit when, when they need help or to admit that others have assisted or have wrought the victory. David unashamedly here mentions that salvation belongeth unto the Lord. And that has been consistent throughout David's life, throughout his writings, that he knew that it is God who gives the victory. We need to do the very same thing today. We need to understand and recognize that whatever efforts that we produce in the kingdom of God, whatever good is done uh, by the works that we accomplish as servants of God, that, that salvation ultimately belongs to him, that glory ultimately belongs to him. Paul recognized this when he contemplated what God had done with him, a blasphemer, a persecutor of the church of Christ. He would write, it is by the grace of God that I am what I am. Uh, it, it is God's grace that makes me what, what I am. Let us close and just, just make a, just a moment of, of reflection as we see this last sila, uh, a moment of application in our life. David was a king, a Jewish king who lived approximately 3,000 years ago. What, what application could I possibly make to my life? Well, I need to remember as I face manifold temptations, struggles, uprisings of some kind, sometimes people will turn, turn against me. Um, maybe it's my fault, maybe it isn't my fault. I need to recognize that the same God that watched out for David, the same God that was a shield for David, the same God that was his glory, was the lifter up of his head, was the one who answers his prayers, is my shield. He's my glory. He's the lifter up of my head, and he'll hear my prayers. I need to have the same trust, confident trust, that David had in my life as, as a child of God.
Thank you so kindly for listening to our lesson today.